Hi everyone and welcome back to this channel. Um, so from the last tutorial, we discovered that the two major resources consumed by our algorithm is the running time and the space. Okay? Actually, there is more emphasis on the running time of an algorithm. Uh, if you've not checked the previous tutorial, I'll put the link in the description so that you can check it out. All right, so normally, as the input size increases, the running time of an algorithm to also increases. So for us to be able to calculate the running time as the input size increases, we need to derive a function. And that function will denote the growth rate. So let's call that function t of n. So t of n denotes the growth rate. Okay? So uh, when n equal to the input size, right, and t is the running time for that particular algorithm. Okay, so let me give you an example so I can understand uh, how we use the t of n function to derive the running time. So let's say t of n uh, equal to 2n. Okay? So when n equal to 1, what's going to be t? Oh, you are right, right? So it's going to be 2, right? When n equal to 2, then t will be equal to what? Right? 4. When n equal to 3, t will be equal to what? Uh, 6. So you can see that if we are given the t of n, we'll be able to derive the running time. Okay? So if uh, t of n, which can also be called the time complexity, can be used to uh, calculate the running time, then how do we derive t of n itself? Okay? So there are two ways to derive t of n. So the first method is this. Okay, so the first way to derive the running time of an algorithm is to examine the exact running time across different input sizes. Okay, uh, uh, actually this is not practical and I will tell you the reason. Okay, but if you want to do it this way, these are the steps that you have to follow. Okay, so these are the steps that you have to follow. So the first one is you start a timer, then you run the algorithm on an input size, then you stop the timer and record the running time, basically the time it took the algorithm to run, then you repeat that process for larger input sizes, then you derive the time complexity. Okay, this is a whole, uh, lot of steps, right? Uh, but I'm going to give you an example to uh, demonstrate this for you. So let's say when you run the algorithm, uh, where n equal to 1. Uh, okay, uh, let me put that up. <clears throat> so let's say when n equal to 1, t equal to 2. Let's say 2 seconds, because we are measuring the exact runtime, right? So we have n equal to 2, let's say t equal to 4 seconds. We have n equal to 3, let's say t equal to 6 seconds. So, I mean, if you check this, right, you can say or you can derive t of n to be equal to 2n. Because each time you increase the size of n by 1, the time is doubled. Alright, so this is not practical, okay? And the reason why this is not practical is because there is no exact time for an algorithm while running a particular input size. So what do I mean by that? So if you run this algorithm the first time, you can get 2 seconds. The second time you run the algorithm, you might get 1.8 seconds. Right, the third time you might get 1.5 seconds. 
So basically, the, there is nothing like a static or an exact running time for, the, for an algorithm. Okay, so this is the first reason why um, this method is not practical. Now, the second reason, uh, I would explain that with an example. Okay, so this is the example. So imagine you have an array of elements uh, from 1 to 7 uh, in ascending order. And you want to search for uh, element 7. Okay? So you want to pick the best algorithm to perform this operation, this, this search operation, and you selected uh, the linear search and um, the binary search. So you want to know which one is the best. Okay? Now, when you uh, run this algorithm, it took uh, two seconds. When you used the linear search algorithm, and when you use the binary search, it took four seconds. Okay? So looking at this, um, if we are to select the best algorithm for this operation, we will go for the linear search. Because the linear search took two seconds, and this took four seconds. Uh, of course, this is absolutely wrong, because the binary search is much more efficient for searching a sorted array than a linear search, okay? So why are we getting this result? This result is affected by uh, another reason, or it's affected by the hardware specification, okay? So the first computer system has a CPU speed of 3.5 gigahertz, and a RAM size of 8 gigabytes. Why the second one has uh, the CPU, a CPU speed of 2.5 gigahertz and um, a RAM size of 4 gigabytes? So looking at those two hardware specifications, you can see that they will definitely affect the running time of the algorithm. Okay? So if you pick the linear search here, you are wrong. Okay? Uh, but looking at the results, you are going to be right. Right? Um, so we don't want uh, to choose the best algorithm because of the computer system that we are using. We want to choose it because of the efficiency of that algorithm. So that is why examining the exact running time of the algorithm is not practical in deciding the time complexity. Okay. Okay. So examining the running, the exact running time of an algorithm to derive the time complexity is not practical. So this method uh, should not be used to derive the time complexity. So the other way to derive the time complexity of an algorithm is called the step count method. Okay. So the step count method is another way, uh, which is the best way to derive the time complexity of an algorithm. So rather than we um, calculating the exact running time, okay, rather than we finding the exact running time, we count the number of instructions that's executed based on the input size. So with that, we derive the time complexity. So let me explain this with an example. So let's say you have um, an algorithm that performs a summation. So uh, this is it. Okay. So this is the summation algorithm. Okay. So what this algorithm does is to calculate the sum of all the elements in an array. So for example, if you have one, two, three, so the sum of the three elements in the array is six. So that's what this algorithm does. So we want to calculate the runtime of this algorithm. So the first thing to do is to mark the instructions that affect the running time of the algorithm. So let's start. So here are the instructions that affect the running time of the algorithm. So we have, uh, to, we have to draw a table, okay? So we have co the cost. 
Now the cost is um, the cost of executing one instruction, like each line of an instruction, the time it takes to run that instruction once. So that is the cost, okay? And this can, uh, the cost can vary uh, from machine to machine, but basically the cost of executing that particular instruction once, okay? So then we have the frequency. So the frequency is the number of times that you are executing a particular instruction, okay? Then we have the total cost. So that is the total cost of executing that instruction. All right. Let's say that the cost of executing this particular line, this particular instruction, let's call that C1. Okay, so how many times are we executing this instruction once? So the total cost is the cost times the frequency. Okay, so in this case, we have C1, right? So the next uh, instruction is the for loop. So let's say the cost of executing the for loop once, I mean, on each iteration is C2, uh, okay? Um, so, what is the frequency? So, how many times is this for loop running? So, the, the for loop is running from i equal to 0 to i equals to um, n minus 1, right? So, i minus n means n minus 1, right? So, if you check out the time or the number of times, this is going to be, it's still going to be n times because we are starting from zero okay so we have n plus now in this expression we have the step so it takes a constant time to check the exit condition for that particular loop okay so for that we have one one is the time it takes to check the exiting condition for the loop, okay? So the total cost will be C2, right, times N plus one. Okay, so let's say the cost for this instruction is C3. The frequency, remember that this instruction is inside the for loop. So the frequency will be N right, then the total cost will be C3, then N, okay? So uh, the return statement too is an instruction. So let's say the cost for executing that instruction is C4 and the frequency is one. So the total cost is C4, okay. So in order to get the total um, runtime, so what do we do? Or to derive, in order to derive the time complexity, so what do we do, right? So we, we, we sum up this column. So we have C of N equal to C1 plus C2 uh, N plus one, right, plus C3 and plus C4. So we collect the like terms, right? So we have C of N equal to uh, All right. So this is the runtime complexity for this particular algorithm, okay? So if C1, let's say C1, C2, C3, and C4 equals to one. So we have uh, equal to one, equal to one, uh, equal to one. So this one means one unit of time. So this can vary from machine to machine, but basically the time allocated by the machine to execute that instruction once. So in that case, we're gonna have T of N 
are equal to 2n right plus 3. So this is the time complexity for this algorithm. Okay. So let's say that you have a runtime complexity uh, that is 5n squared plus 6n plus 12. Okay, so normally we eliminate the lower terms because in the long run, the term that occupies or that takes the percentage of the runtime is what we want to keep. So let's uh, look at this. Let's uh, change the input size and let's see which of the terms will take most of uh, the runtime. Okay, so yn equal to 1, right? So Okay, so now we have n equals to 1, right? So we want to see which of the terms would uh, take most of the runtime in the long run. That is, which of the, uh, the term would take the most percentage of the runtime in the long run. So percentage of runtime due to 5n squared is 21.7%. Uh, due to 5, 6n, uh, that is 26.04%. Due to 12, we have 52.17%. Uh, in this case, 12 is taking uh, most percentage of the runtime. However, however, uh, n is still equals to 1. So this is in the short run, right? So we want to know in the long run which of the time we take most percentage of the runtime. So let's increase the size of n and see which of the term will take most percentage of the runtime. So we can see from this table that as n uh, increased, okay, the term that took most percentage of the runtime is the 5n squared. Okay, so if you check out the last uh, percentages here, when n equals to 1000, 5n squared, I mean, took 99.88 percentage of the running time. Uh, 6n took 0.12 percent, and 12 took uh, 0.002 percentage of the running time, right? So you can see that, I mean, in the long run, 5n squared is uh, dominates <laughs> the running time, okay? So we can uh, deduce from this table that... Uh, C of n uh, can be equal to five n squared because this other two, this other, this other uh, percentages are negligible. Okay, so I mean they are negligible. This is ninety nine point eight eight, right? Okay, so this is the approximate approximate time complexity. So while we are trying to derive the time complexity, we are much more focused towards the approximate time complexity. Or you can also call this the asymptotic asymptotic complexity. So that's another name you can call this. All right. So, uh, yeah, thank you everyone um, for staying to the end of this tutorial. Please don't forget to subscribe. It's very, very important. And um, if you have any question, uh, feel free to put it in the comment box. You can like, uh, I'll be so, so great. And if you have suggestions, probably topic that we can treat in this channel, you can also put it in the comment box. In our next tutorial, we'll be looking at the big O notation the theta and the big omega. So this is how you measure the worst case, average case, and uh, the tight bound of, uh, of an algorithm. Okay? So that's what we're going to be looking at in the next tutorial. So see you there. Bye, everyone.